Welcome to the second Space Friends devlog. This is going to be a really interesting episode because so many different tasks I've been working on over the past couple of months for this game, they're all culminating into this one specific moment, which is this video. I'm super excited to share it with you, but before I get started, I just want to send a big thanks out to everyone who watched my last devlog, all of your comments, all of your support. It means so much to me. I really appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. I also want to send out a special thank you for those of you who voted on the color scheme for the bounty hunter. I honestly couldn't pick one and I'm so thankful that you all voted. I know I'm supposed to tell you to wait till the end of the video or something so you'll watch more and I'll get better numbers. But to be perfectly honest, I'm absolutely so sick of just making things with the sole intent of trying to impress an algorithm. So with that said, here's the final bounty hunter votes and here's the final color selection. Thanks everyone who did vote. I really love this color scheme. It's kind of the one I thought you all might pick, but you never know with the internet. And now I have internet confirmation. I also just set up a Patreon for Space Friends. So if you're a fan of the project, if you like this content and you want more regular updates, or you just want to help financially support it, which I would greatly appreciate, head on over to the link below in the description. Thanks everyone. Finally, uh, for those of you who are just joining, I want to welcome you to the devlog and Space Friends community. I want to give you just a quick summary to catch you up and let you know what you're getting yourself into here. So Space Friends is a space road trip survival game. It's inspired by the planet jumping mechanics of Faster Than Light, the real-time traveling and random events of Oregon Trail, and the friendship building of Mass Effect, particularly Mass Effect 1, which had a huge impact on me. There are definitely some sprinkles of roguelikes and choose your own adventures in there to keep it kind of fresh and make the mechanics really exciting. But overall, that's what you'll be doing. So what's the story? The story is you and three crew members receive a distress signal from the greatest friend in the universe. It's a difficult decision, but ultimately you all decide, yeah, let's go do this. So you start traveling to distant planets, making new alien friends, making new alien enemies, and hopefully not dying before you make it to the end. Did I mention there's space pizza? Because there's definitely going to be space pizza. More on that later, though. Also, I won a Twitch grant a year and a half ago to start making space friends. And ever since I started on this project, I fell in love with creating this world. If you want to hear more about how I got started and the whole Twitch grant, definitely check out the first devlog right here. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's get into it. I want to start with how I view game production because it'll help you to understand why this moment in my game, Space Friends, is such a huge event. I think in game design, there's two types of tasks, vertical tasks and horizontal tasks. If we put the start of the game development here and the completion of game development here, you can see that tasks have two dimensions. They can go up and down or they can go left and right. A vertical task is a task that goes only up and down. Well, basically up. It's not dependent on any other tasks to be completed. So as soon as you finish it, you just move to the next task and it gets you closer to your goal. Think of something like adding jumping to your character in a platforming game. You'll sit down and your character won't be able to jump. So you pull up a YouTube tutorial, you start coding, and then in a few hours, maybe even less, it's done. You feel like the greatest game designer who ever game designed. So what about tasks that go left and right? I call these horizontal tasks. These tasks require many smaller tasks to be completed before you can finish the main task. Think of this as like the bank heists in GTA. You have the bank heist quest, it's the main quest, but before you can do it, you have to case the location, recruit a team member, prepare all the tools, buy the costumes, all that stuff. So in your game, as you map out your smaller tasks you need to do before you can complete the main task, you start to realize that this task doesn't feel like forward progress at all. 
almost like you're on a treadmill. You're really close to completing it, but you're not moving closer to the goal, it seems like. So instead, this task becomes horizontally much bigger, and sometimes they even get bigger the more you work on them. A great example of a horizontal task is making an inventory for an RPG. At first glance, you may be inclined to just write on your task list, make inventory system. And that might actually sound reasonable. But then when you start to build it, you realize it's not that simple. You actually need art, like icons and potions, before you can begin. You need a layout for the UI before you can begin. You need to plan for what happens when the inventory is full. Then there's the dreaded saving and loading, and you have to decide if you'll allow stacking of similar items. It goes on and on. Before you know it, you're weeks in on something that hasn't looked any different visually since the first couple days you started it. In my opinion, a game designer's ability to navigate these horizontal tasks reveals their ability to complete the game at all. And I know that sounds harsh, but it's really not meant to be. I think as game designers, people fault us for our inability to plan out development timelines that are real. People always look at us and go, well, how did you not know that was going to take longer? But we don't think about horizontal tasks because we're so enamored with the rush of vertical tasks. Vertical tasks are so delicious because they bolster our confidence and they make us feel like, wow, when I sat down today, the character couldn't jump. Now they can. Imagine what I'll do tomorrow. It also doesn't help that you get the external feedback of showing people. Your loved one or a friend may have seen your game the day before, and now when you show it to them, they can jump and you see this elated look on their face. You just feel like you brought so much joy to the world and you did it with ease. I feel like this causes so many devs to end up building external reward relationships with these vertical tasks because they make us feel so good. But the truth is, as you progress on your game development, you will have less and less vertical tasks and more and more horizontal tasks. That's because anything of great complexity is probably some of the main reasons why you set out to make this game in the first place. So here's a couple of ways I try to get ahead of these kinds of tasks, and maybe they'll help you too. First up, if you don't already, make a task list. Taking all of those things that you want to do in your game and putting them down into something like a Trello board is so helpful. Also, games are one of the most complicated multidisciplinary mediums you could ever work in. So it's really taxing on your brain to keep remembering all of the things that you want to try and accomplish. Two, when you do write down a task, just take a moment to think, is there anything before this task gets completed that I have to wait on or I need that I'm not thinking about? You'd be surprised how if you just ask the question, your brain will fill in the answers. And one final tip, probably my most important tip, try to save your vertical tasks. It's so enticing when you start to build a game to do all of the easy, quick, and impactful tasks up front. But if you do them all like that, then you're only left with the hardest things. And this can really crush your morale and sometimes even kill your game. Okay, with all that said, in this devlog, I'm about to complete the single biggest horizontal task in my entire game so far. And that task is talking to aliens on the bridge. To do this task, I'll need to make the bridge in 3D, I'll need to make an alien in 3D, and make a mini game where you translate alien words by playing hangman, because that's how you translate what aliens say. So let's start with the bridge. When I first started making Space Friends, I really didn't think much about the bridge. It just seemed like a funny throwaway room, and I figured it'd be fairly simple to make some 3D furniture, some chairs, some computers, import it into Unity, and done. So I loaded up Blender, and nope, 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 nope. This is what I made, and it's been in the game since I made it, and I cannot stand to look at it. I decided to bring in some professionals. So to make the bridge, I'm going to need two 2D concepts, one of the front of the bridge, one of the back. 
I'm going to need a model of the actual player for size, and then I'm going to need the 3D artist to build all the 3D assets, and then materials and lighting, and since my game uses cell shading, it's also going to take some time to ensure it all looks just right. So let's start with the 2D concept art. For some cosmically lucky reason, when I was searching for a concept artist to work with, I found out that the brother of my two-year-old's babysitter makes amazing alien comics? Yeah, you should definitely check them out. We immediately started on the bridge. For context, this was four months before this video you're watching, so that's when I first started working on this bridge. I always make a mood board when I design games like this with big worlds, so I knew the general direction of what I wanted the bridge to look like, but that wasn't going to be enough to just give to a concept artist. By the way, my personal preference is to use Pinterest when making a mood board for a new world or environment or even just a character. I'm always amazed at how I start with a board and I pick one or two pictures and then it shows me all these different possibilities that I can choose from until eventually I can see the world in just a few pictures. And more importantly, I can share that concept with anyone who works on the game so they can immediately pick up the vibe. I shared this mood board with James, but I wanted to give him something more because I had a really clear vision of what I wanted, I just didn't know how to get there. So against my better judgment, I opened up Blender once again, and this time I really pushed myself to make something that represented what was in my brain. I knew it didn't have to be perfect, but I figured if I could just get even 10% of it, maybe it would really help. And it did. I felt like when I was done, I could show James the scale and the size of the room and basic details that I thought I was going to want. A couple days later, he sent me these four bridge concepts. Now, the first thing that hit me was how much he nailed the humor that I wanted for my game. I didn't want overt funny, I wanted subtle funny, like a broken chair replaced with a fold-out chair. It's not an obvious joke, I don't even know if it is a joke, but if you think about it a little bit, it's pretty humorous. Like we're in space in the distant future and they still use fold-out chairs? For the bridge, like these chairs are supposed to be bolted to the floor for when an enemy ship attacks and everyone has to flip over a railing. Yeah, so this is my sense of humor, hate it or love it, it's everywhere in this universe. And I'm a big fan. It's the age old idea that the jokes aren't funny, it's the people and the situations that are funny, or in this case, the environment that's funny. So I started to refer to this as old RV style, like how new RVs always market themselves as cutting edge luxury with space age solutions for traveling, when in reality these solutions start breaking the moment you drive off the lot and you end up with parts that need to be held together with duct tape and screws and over time, because everything is built on top of itself, you can't fix the shower door because you can't do it without replacing the entire wall which was discontinued five years ago. Yeah, stuff like that. So this ship, the, um, okay, I don't have a name for this ship. Uh, maybe you guys could help me out. If you are inspired and you feel like you have a name for this ship, can you shout it out in the comment section below? So yeah, this ship, the blank, was a luxury mid-budget ship 20 years ago. But now, 20 years later, three different owners, a few collisions with asteroids, it's definitely showing its age. So this old RV style and these little details, I mean, I don't know, maybe no one will really get them, but I love them and they make me laugh and I believe they all contribute to my unique take on space. So I'm just gonna keep going and seeing where it goes. So, okay, old RV style, great. Back to these bridge concepts. None of these bridge concepts felt like they were the one. So instead, I picked the parts I liked from each one, and James did another pass. 
So I liked the chairs from this one, the room aesthetic of this one. I loved the post-it notes on this one and the console from this one. And yeah, and the air conditioner. Let's take that too. So we took all those and mixed them up and then voila, James comes back with the sketch and I'm like, oh yeah, that's the one. Like no revisions, none. Don't even touch it. It's perfect. Artists are just wizards with pencils instead of wands. Next, he prepared some color comps, but let's be real, only one of these is the right one. After that, it was time to make the back of the bridge. With all this done, it was time to pass these along to the 3D artist to start building the bridge assets so they could be put in the game. This part was like putting bread into the oven. Once the concept art is done, it's done. All I can do is just put my head next to the door window and watch it bake. But I have to say, it's really fun to watch it bake. Like with every new pass the 3D artist sends to me, it just breathes more and more life into it. And I just see this concept art becoming a real 3D environment. So we import it to Unity, add the colors and the materials, and oh dang. Uh, can we cue some sexy saxophone music? bridge is done. Two more tasks before talking to an alien on the bridge is a task of the past. So let's make an alien. For the alien, I had James just look at my mood board. We had a bunch of discord calls talking about what I was looking for. For some reason, this frog alien catches my eye. Maybe because the only reason I play Star Fox is to shoot Slippy out of the sky. Love you, Slippy. But either way, we start with this one. So I wanted them to stand up, have an eye at the end of their tail, wear a utility belt, and have a tongue head inside their mouth, which is actually what's controlling the alien. Almost like the frog is an exobody and the tongue head controls everything inside and can pop out to talk to other beings when it's safe. And their skin is semi-transparent so you can see their internal organs and bones. Yeah, all that. Finally, I wanted to make the face a little more bug-like and cross that uncanny valley like is it a bug or a frog or an iguana and just hit that sweet spot of I'm not sure. So with all these changes, James starts the final T poses for the 3D artist and the colors and let's just bask in this moment where I didn't know how much it would cost both in time and money to build this character in 3D because as far as 3D character design goes, I believe this character is like going to a restaurant and ordering the entire menu. Yeah, let me walk you through some things I learned about making a 3D character that might help you when you make a 3D character. So first off, humanoid characters are the easiest. In this case, this isn't terrible, because it is a humanoid, it's on two feet, it has two arms, but making a tongue head that pops out of the mouth and having a sentient eye tail, those things were more than just your basic run-of-the-mill humanoid. The other thing is semi-transparent. Even thinking about this character, it's like, is there anything I didn't put into this character? Anyway, semi-transparent. This requires the 2D artist to make comps of the organs and bones, which I am obsessed with, but then the 3D artist had to make all those internal organs and paint them and then rig them and then animate them separately. <sighs> this is exhausting even to talk about. I hope this is helpful. And are you ready for the big one? Organic material and layering. So the skin of the Alonza are like frog skin, kind of bulbous, rounded, and like thicky boy. But then on top of that, the utility belt had to be its own separate thing, but move with the organic skin material when it moves. So this was really like the main course. 
So now I only make characters that are humanoid and have no organic material. They are not transparent and they only have two eyes. So <laughs> just kidding. All right, moving right along. This character ends up taking over six weeks to build. Now, my 3D artist is only part time. I can only afford five hours a week, but still in six weeks, that would be 48 hours. That's like a full week of a 3D artist just working on one character, which if I want my universe to be filled with spaceships and aliens and everything, uh, this game will never get done. So yeah, anyway, totally worth because at the end of it, I love this character and I learned so much and I feel like this character was an anchor point for what the rest of this universe is going to look like. like. Fun, could be dangerous, unexpected, humorous, all of those things I feel like this character embodies. Oh, and friendship. I mean, who doesn't want to be friends with this guy? Okay, so let's go back to the task list and we can cross all these off. Now for the final part. The Alien Translation Hangman Minigame. So this all started because in Space Friends, I had this idea that you won't be able to beat the final boss of the game alone. So as you travel the universe, you'll come across different aliens that you can become friends with. And if you do, when you get to the end, they'll actually show up and help you defeat the boss. Now, if this sounds familiar, it should sound familiar because it is the best part of every RPG. And you know what I'm talking about. You're a kid, your mom wakes you up way too early to go to school, on your way to school the end of the world starts happening, you have to be the only person in the world who can save it, and so when you go on this adventure, you end up meeting all these friends who ultimately go on this trip with you and you go to the very end of the game and you defeat the boss and you just feel like you met the best friends in the world. So that's, that's a tall order. And I really didn't have a plan for how I was going to do this, but I trusted my brain would figure it out. And it sure did. So one day, a few months ago, I'm taking a shower where all of my great ideas come from. And I'm thinking about the bridge and talking to aliens and how it's going to happen when I just start bursting into laughter, like out loud, because I have this image of the main screen on the bridge having a numerical pad on it for making phone calls. I don't know why still when I talk about this, it is so hilarious to me. I mean, I do know why it's because it's this amazing piece of futuristic technology, and yet you still have to type in phone numbers to call people. I don't know, there's just something about it that like gets me every time I think about it. So this silly idea, as small as it was, sparked a ton of ideas. Like being able to call any of your alien friends anytime you wanna just say what's up or ask them to help you out with some credits because you're low on fuel. And then this idea to turn the ship's screen into a giant phone also created some other ideas that I promised myself I wasn't going to go into in this video because I will just keep talking about it forever. But the short version is I was thinking about what happens if a player just types in a random number because that's exactly what I would do if I was playing. I'd be like, oh, you give me a phone. I'm going to just punch in numbers and see if you actually like make something happen in the universe. And so a few days later, again, in the shower, my brain came up with an intergalactic pizza chain, which is so expansive that any random number probably is one of these pizza places. And you can actually order a pizza with specific toppings and they will deliver it to you and it will give your crew members certain boosts or negative effects. So it's not, we're not even, I'm not even done yet. We're just at the tip of the iceberg. So when I explain this idea to my programmer, he says, well, to do this, the pizza place would be similar to how I'm designing the back end for alien friends. You know, you can make an enemy or a friend. And that if I wanted to, the player could be friends with the pizza company or yes, yes you could make them an enemy. So, 
Okay, I have to stop myself here because I'm already doing exactly what I said I wasn't going to do. So I'm saving the Intergalactic Pizza Wars for another video. <sighs> I can do this. Focus. Focus. The bridge is a phone. Let's go back to that. So one use for this bridge phone for talking to aliens is when you meet an unknown ship and they quote unquote hail you or in this case call you as an unknown caller. The screen lights up. You can accept or decline the call. Of course, if you decline it, you're probably going straight into a red alert space battle with them. And I should mention, I plan to make it so you can buy ringtones at space markets and swap them out because like that was one of the best parts of the early 2000s. Uh, I have one ringtone, actually. I'm just going to play it for you guys right now because it's such a vibe and I love it. accept the aliens call you have to figure out what they're saying because you've never talked to them before so you have to play hangman to figure it out oh and make no mistake it's really hangman if you guess wrong too many times they get angry and attack or if you translate what they say fast enough they could become your friends so i started working on a mock-up of the hangman game you see the letters that you can choose there's ones you already chose and it'll tell you if they were correct or incorrect and then there's this alien, their bridge, and a bar showing how happy or angry they are, which changes based on how many answers you got, correct or incorrect. I actually had this first version here, but then I wasn't satisfied with it because that's just how I am. So I made another version because I wanted to show more of the bridge and just not make it feel so UI-ish, if that makes sense. Also, side note, I'm making this game playable on Twitch with chat integration, so there's additional UI for chat to take turns guessing letters too if you play that way. Okay, so now that the Hangman game is complete, and the bridge is complete, and the aliens complete, we can finally put them all together. So let's boot it up and take it for a spin. Okay, well, if you detect some very deflated sound in my voice, that's because this devlog has taken me over two months to finish. I don't know why I decided to make a 30-minute devlog. I really don't. But everything that I captured in the devlog shows the work that I've been doing over the past five months on this game. And I have this grand vision for this game and I've been doing all this work and I got the bridge made and I got the 3D model of the alien made and my programmer worked last night to get the hangman game to work because I'm going to be taking a family vacation for the first time in a long time next or tomorrow, next week, tomorrow. And so in between packing all day, I have been trying to finish this devlog so that I can go take a break and relax. Um, the reason I sound deflated is because I've spent thousands of dollars over the past couple months to build this vision and I feel like I'm sitting in front of something that is telling me it needs still so much more work. And I thought that I was going to have this grand reveal. And I thought that it would be like crazy amazing. And what I really feel like is I'm just like gluing and stapling things to together in the back of a bus while I'm headed to school to turn in my project. Let me show you what I have. So... <sighs> This is the very real side of game design. You try to build something 
and then you realize you're way deep and that what you spend all your time building doesn't look like what you want and doesn't play like what you want and you just have to go back to it. The reason I'm like stalling is because my programmer had to change the way that we fundamentally do the say like loading scenes because I wanted the bridge to have the hangman game inside the screen, but we didn't have it like that before. Before you would be on the bridge and then it would just load a different bridge because none of this existed. So we didn't know. Um, and so you would just play the hangman in a different place. And so last night I was talking to him and I was saying, you know, it'd be really great if we could just get like the hangman game to appear inside the main bridge that we just built. And he's like, well, the game doesn't work like that. We didn't build it that way. Don't mind the clipping. That's just, um, <laughs> just mocking me. So anyway, he got it to work, but it's a whole new system. So it meant that we had to break other things. Like for instance, um, we had to break the fact that you would press start before and you would see a star map and you could pick where you were going and then you would see like your ship traveling. But just to get this to even work so we could show it, um, he had to basically break all of that because it has to be rebuilt now because it's not going to instantiate a different separate place to play the game. It's going to happen all right here on the screen. And then even still, I feel like when I look at it, the screen is like so tiny. Oh man, struggles. Anyway, so I'm going to press start and what you'll see is the incoming call. I don't know why it's artifacting like this. I have a feeling it has something to do with the shader. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why it looks like. Um, I don't even I can't even think of a funny metaphor. That's how like burnout I am on this. Anyway, you press accept and then we, this doesn't line up. I have to fix that. The alien, we had the animation for the alien, but I, I can't get it to work for some reason. Um, I reformatted this because it needed to be all reformatted because it's a different size now. I don't know. It it just I don't know. I have a big vision for this game and it just feels like let's talk to this guy anyway. Let's see what he has to say. So um no B's. There's a lot of R's. There's a T maybe, yeah. Uh guess some vowels. This bar doesn't connect yet, or at least I think maybe it was connected when it was vertical, but we changed it to be this floating horizontal one, which needs work. Um, J? No, why am I even picking J? Like, that's so ridiculous. J wouldn't be there. O? Error. <laughs> Error. Is this game making fun of me? Are you making fun of me right now? What is the... What's the word? What is your word? A? And fortunately, I don't think you can get a game over on, on this. So I critic <laughs> critical error. <laughs> so rude. <sighs> so rude. Oh, my God. If you see this, too, all these black screens. None of these lights work. I was going to try and get that done this week. It doesn't work. I was able to get this camera spline thing in, which is a great plugin on Unity, but I couldn't make it like dynamic. So it was before like floating behind, but then it would be too far away from the screen because the screen's too small. Ah, oh, dang, man. Anyway, I know I'm like, 
I know there's good stuff here and I know that there's a lot of hard work that went into this and I and I love it. I just don't feel great about it right now. So I just want this game to be I want it to match what I see inside and it's not doing that right now. It's doing the opposite. I feel like all this work and it just makes me feel like there's just more more that needs to be done. Like like yeah, like this is a bigger vertical, sorry, bigger this is a bigger horizontal task than I thought it was. It's just not it's not that easy. There's still a whole lot of stuff that has to go into this to make it work. <sighs> I'm going to end this devlog here, guys, because um, I really <laughs> got to get this devlog out and up. And I really appreciate you guys sticking along with this journey. I'm going to go to the beach with my family for a week. I'm going to clear my mind. I'm going to not look at this and come back with fresh eyes and be ready to do whatever it takes. Cause I'm going to tell you right now, I got a vision in my mind for what this game's going to look like and how it's going to play and how it's going to feel. And we're not there yet. We're not even close. We're not even close to what my vision is for this game. All right. Thanks for hanging out guys. I hope you enjoyed this devlog. I wish I could leave on a high, but that sometimes just isn't how it is. <laughs> sometimes not how it is. All right. Catch you guys later. Curtis Wow. Ow.